I'm Evelyn Kalp, interviewing her. Welcome to Abby's History Bites, hosted by Martha Owen, the Heritage Collection Manager at the Evelyn Lehman Kalp Heritage Collection at the Napanee Center. Welcome to another episode of Evie's History Bites. If you're a first-time listener, we're glad you found us. If you're a regular listener, welcome back, and we're so glad that you continually hit play. I'm your host, Martha, and welcome to our local history podcast about Napanee. We have a great show for you today. We have Jake and Nikki Beer on the podcast to talk about Miller's Orchard. But before we get to them, let's have a little history lesson. Not many places can claim that they have an apple orchard within their city limits. That is just one more thing that makes Napanee so unique. At one time, the orchard was a lot bigger, and over the years, it has shrunk due to Napanee's growth and prosperity. The Uline family purchased the property when they moved from Wakarusa to Napanee. They were the owners of the Napanee Lumber Manufacturing Company, and they also had the butter tub factory. After U- Walter Uline retired from Napanee Lumber, and manufacturing company, he developed the orchard as somewhat of a hobby and pastime to keep himself busy. It was named Uline Orchard. By the time Mr. Uline passed away in 1946, there were thousands of fruit trees planted. There were 1,008 apple trees to be exact and 350 peach trees. After Mr. Uline's death, Frank and Charles Lehman and Fred Culp purchased the property in July of 1946. It had a total of 21 acres and it also included a house. In August of 1946, the orchard was being run by H.H. Feldman, according to the Napanee News. In 1947, it was projected that the apple trees were on track to produce thousands of bushels of apples. In 1951, the orchard appears in the newspaper for sale once again, and that the property could be purchased with or without the house. Guy and Roberta Loudermilk ran the orchard, had purchased and ran the orchard for seven years. The Loudermilks had moved to Napanee from Knox, and Guy had ran the Fairy Theater for a number of years, and Roberta was the first woman elected to the Napanee City Council in the early 1960s. In 1957, the orchard appears for sale once again in the newspapers. This time, there's only 14 acres for sale. The orchard was purchased in 1958 by Harley and Mary Miller, and they planted new trees and built structures to produce cider and apple butter, which they're famous for. Their son Maynard operated a grocery store from the late 1970s to 1997. It could be said that the big box stores and the big chain grocery stores is one of the reasons why the store closed. You can also say that the orchard itself is the reason why Napanee has its apple festival every third weekend in September. The Millers continue to operate and make apple butter and cider, but on a much smaller scale after the market closed. The last of the orchard was sold off in 2019, and in 2020, Nikki, Harley, and Mary's granddaughter and her husband, Jake, were given the opportunity to purchase the orchard back. They have since reopened the market and have plans to expand the orchard. I sat down with Jake and Nikki Beer and we talked about all things Miller's Orchard. So why don't, uh, Nikki and Jake, why don't you just tell us about yourselves? All right, I am Nikki Beer. I was originally a Miller. I grew up here in Napanee and have lived here most of my life. There was a period of time after college where we lived in Indianapolis for about a decade. And part of the reason we came back was to answer the call to uh, start the orchard. And I'm Jake Beer, married to Nikki Beer. (laughs) (laughs) Also um, raised in Napanee, Northwood grad. Um, Yeah, like Nikki said, we left Napanee after high school Uh, went to college, lived in Indianapolis for some years, and long story short, are back in Napanee growing apples. (laughs) So uh, tell us just a little bit about Miller's Orchard. Miller's Orchard was purchased in 1958 by my grandparents, Harley and Mary Miller. 
Um, they were not the original owners of the orchard. The orchard was actually planted in the 1930s and had changed ownership a couple of times before it became um, my grandparents. They ran the orchard up until um, their death, actually. Grandma died, ironically, on Apple Festival weekend <laughs> in 2008, um, and Grandpa passed away a few short years after that. And so my uncle, who had always been involved in the business, um, primarily doing the apple butter and the cider production, had taken over um, in that interim time between grandma and grandpa's death and then from us taking over in, um, as the third generation. So most people knew the orchard um, throughout the decades as a full service orchard. My dad had a grocery store there on site when I was growing up as a kid. That was from the 1970s, um, and it closed in the 1990s. Grandpa took care of the trees. He did plant, um, he did do several new plantings with him as the owner. Um, and then he took care of the trees, and my Uncle Nelson took care of um, apple butter and cider. One thing that Miller's, Miller's Orchard became known for was the apple butter and the cider. And so at the time, the laws were such that that cider could be wholesale to other grocery stores. So at its prime, we were selling um, a thousand gallons a week oh, wow. to various grocery stores. Um, what's happened since is there's been some laws that have changed that now unpasteurized cider cannot be sold um, at grocery stores like that. It can only be sold um, on site. And so that part of the business has gone to the wayside a little bit, although we do have many loyal followers <laughs> that come down um, to get our ciders still. The apple butter um, has also been a mainstay. What a lot of people don't know about the apple butter is Grandma and Grandpa released <laughs> the name brand of the apple butter, which was called Amish apple butter back in the 1950s. That was released under their name brand but then it was also done in a private label capacity. And so for decades, it was distributed coast to coast under other people's names. And so um, many times people would, could go into um, a mire and pick up the apple butter and they might not realize that that was actually apple butter produced um, mm -hmm. in our kettles on our property with our recipe. And so, um, and they also had quite a bit of relationships with other orchards producing apple butter for them. Um, and so that's what I would say in a nutshell. That's Miller's Orchard. All right, um, so you had a unique situation come up when you were able to purchase back mm -hmm. the orchard. So do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so we had originally tried to buy the orchard from my family in 2007, 2008, no, is that the right date? That sounds about right. Um, it, was, it was after, no, it's after that, 2010. In 2010 is when we started to make moves to maybe see if the family would be interested in selling to us as the third generation. Um, and it became somewhat clear that, you know, Perhaps the timing wasn't right. Um, I, my uncle wasn't ready to retire, and that was okay. The one thing that was strange, though, is we really felt on our heart the Lord calling us to this. And so what we, what we didn't understand is if we were getting called to this, then why wasn't this happening as a smooth transaction and a, you know, a smooth you know, pass of the baton from the second to the third generation? Um, we would go on. We ended up moving back to Napanee. Um, continuing to work for other people and had sort of made peace with the fact that maybe the orchard is what brought us back to Napanee because we were never going to come back here anyway. So we made peace with maybe this that's all the orchard ever was supposed to be was the thing that called us back home even though it never came to fruition. In the meantime, um, through Jake's position at uh, Living Gospel Church, we met Thomas Mast. One thing you should know about Thomas is that when my grandfather ha was still living, he sold off 
um, plots to Thomas in several different transactions, one that took place in the early 90s and then uh, another transaction that happened um, later. And what the family was actually left with was really only six rows of apple trees. So most of the orchard, even though trees still existed on it, mm -hmm. actually belonged to Thomas. And the understanding was that the family could use those trees until Thomas decided, decided to start doing development on them. And so, you know, we knew even at best if we got the property from the family, we didn't really have an orchard. I mean, we only had six rows of apple trees at best and buildings. And, um, and so through the, uh, Jake's position at Living Gospel, he got to meet Thomas and in conversation it came up about the orchard and he connected the dots that he was married to me and that we actually had some interest in perhaps um, giving the orchard a go and it was nothing really more than passing conversation I would say um, he had asked us maybe what our thoughts would be about that but there was never really any sort of formal meeting or I don't know, formal business plan or anything presented. In the meantime, I knew my family was getting ready to sell the property to, to Thomas and what would have been a final transaction. And what was strange is that that whole time, Jake and I kept feeling, we kept, I kept praying this prayer specifically, like, Lord, if this isn't meant to be, then I don't want it on my heart anymore. Like, I don't understand all these pieces that haven't really worked out why is it still on our heart just take it away and what I didn't know is what was happening behind the scenes and so in January of um, 2020 Thomas and Linda Mass called us into their office and they told us in not so many words that we bought this orchard for you Oh, wow. And we bought this orchard so that you could um, make a run of it in honor of your grandparents. And what I didn't know is that um, Thomas and Linda each have very special stories um, about the orchard and what it meant to them. Linda's parents, Malin and Irene, were very dear friends of my grandparents and spent many, many, many hours mm -hmm. down there sorting, grading apples with my grandparents in the early days. Thomas grew up at the back of the orchard and grandpa was his first employer. He would pick pick up apples <laughs> <laughs> for him. And I had no idea. And so it was really sort of beautiful to see how this story was intertwined in a way that is nothing Jake or I could have orchestrated. And so what they did is Thomas was willing to um, redo the property lines so that we could have a meaningful orchard plant. So the property lines were redrawn and um, Thomas and Linda uh, helped us get it up and going. And mm -hmm. so he was, they were very generous and very kind and um, gave us the start that we needed. I had long said that if this orchard was ever gonna be something that we did, there were some major mountains that the Lord had to move, and that was one of those mountains. And so it was a beautiful story. Um, it is a beautiful story, and I'm forever grateful. He would probably hate it if he knew that I was mentioning him by name uh, <laughs> on a podcast like this, but I do think he's a very humble man, and he's a very kind man and a very generous man. And I, mm -hmm. I think that that humility is what would keep him from ever bringing something like this up. And so we entered into a purchase agreement um, with he and Linda to purchase the orchard um, outright. And so, um, yeah, it's just been a journey ever since. Because of the way it came about, I know that it is something that the Lord wanted for Napanee. And mm -hmm. it's a story that's bigger than me and my family and Jake. Mm -hmm. And so it, um, it's an honor to, to do this. For Napanee. Yeah. yeah. So what are what are plans for the orchard moving forward? 
I'm not going to hog the mic, honey. <laughs> I was hoping I could just talk about trees and how we make apple butter. Okay, so I'll talk about one side of it. Jake will talk about the other <clears> side. <throat> um, so our plan is it became really clear when Grandma passed away, uh, probably because she was first um, before Grandpa. When we went through the process of her funeral, um, I was blown away. I tell people that's the moment that my heart was pricked to even want to come back and do this. Um, mm -hmm. I was a city girl. I wanted, you know, Indianapolis or big cities. I didn't want a small town. And But I watched so many people come through and, and talk about how much the orchard meant to them, how much grandma meant to them. And it wasn't that she did anything like spectacular other than she invested in people. She invested in conversation and relationships and people. Um, she was kind and she was generous. And it was evident um, that the orchard was never really about apples. It was a vessel that brought people down there while she did her ministry. And so um, all that to say, it was very important to us to bring a retail presence back to the orchard. So a small one had existed down in an, a sales building but it was important for us to utilize my dad's old building where miller's market was and create a space that was um that was comfortable that was clean that people could come into and that was just inviting and so that's the side of the business that i sort of oversee which is the retail side and creating um, a place for all of that and so I tell people what's interesting is the things that we're doing now in that retail footprint are things I said I was never going to do. Like I, I was never going to get into some of the partnerships with meat and produce and any of that. And those mm -hmm. have actually been some of the biggest blessings that we have down there. We were just going to be apple cider, apple butter, and then maybe highlighting some local vendors. But it's funny, everything that we have developed into has just been wonderful divine appointments of people walking through our doors saying hey have you ever thought about this this is what i do this is what i make this is what i create so that is the retail side of what we do um, and what we want to create for napanee looking forward into the future we hope to just be an indoor farmer's market and so in the winter months we're an indoor farmer's market that has a shorter schedule Thursday, Friday, Saturday. From June to December, we're a farmer's market that happens Monday through Saturday. We really love local goods, local farmers, um, but recognize that sometimes there's other um, artisans out there that are small batch or have a great story, but maybe they're not from um, Indiana. And so we just are always looking at that to um, we do hope in the coming years to open a U pick up, mm -hmm. um, down amongst the trees. But I'll let Jake talk about apple butter, cider, and apples since that's <laughs> that's his deal. Yeah. So just to piggyback on what Nikki said, we really wanted to make it a point to champion and partner with local farmers. Um, one of the things that we loved about living in Indy was there was a, a weekend farmer's market that we would go to almost every weekend and buy, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and meats when we could. And it always was just a neat, like, sense of community. And so um, it's been fun getting to know local farmers here in Napanee. We partnered with several of them um, exclusively over the last three years. And then kind of fill in the gaps with things, like Nikki said, from other um, people that are similar to us that are running family-oriented businesses, maybe not necessarily in our community, but in um, a 100 or a 200 mile radius. Um, so the apple butter um, is something that kind of goes on behind the scenes. Nikki mentioned a lot of people don't know that we still do that, but we have two 150-gallon um, kettles they're actually the same kettles that her grandfather used that he put in. Um, and so we make apple butter pretty much year round, um, primarily September through like March. And then we sort of 
don't do it as much during the summer months because we don't have access to apples. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that we're doing um, and shipping, like Nikki said, all over the country. We have distributors on the West Coast and the East Coast, um, private label for other orchards. Um, and then there's a lot of um, orchards, what, in a 100-mile radius around here that we, mm -hmm. that we, they bring product to us in the fall. So they'll bring us their apples and we'll make apple butter with their apples. Okay. Um, cider goes on primarily September to December during the heart of apple season. And eventually we'll be able to use apples grown here on Miller's Orchard again. Um, unfortunately, our trees are still very young and not um, able to produce the amount of apples that we will need. So we do supplement from other orchards in Indiana and Michigan. Um, what would you say on average we do cider wise maybe apple festival weekend is is our sort of kickoff weekend so um, this past year we did I think 1200 gallons of apple cider oh wow for that, the festival for the festival um, one of the things to back up a little bit about the trees so when we took over the property there were still apple trees on the property but grandpa had planted that plot so many years ago um, I mean I don't know 70s maybe um, trees were yeah about late 60s years early 70s uh, my dad has vivid memories of replanting those at, or planting that plot and so what most people don't realize is fruit trees have fruit producing years um, I guess just like people <laughs> and they get to the high side and they're not going to be um, good producers anymore. So major orchards will continually be ripping trees out and planting them and staggering them and whatnot. But um, that combined with it had been it had been quite a while since they were cared for um, and most of them were overrun with poison ivy and such that it just made sense. The other thing that grandpa's orchard was it was many old-fashioned varieties and so the plot that was left with trees on it were only red and golden delicious and so it felt like you know if we wanted to open this up and have people down here being able to pick apples we should probably just rip them out and start from scratch because even cleaning them up and pruning them back we were still a big roll of the dice on if they would even ever bear fruit and so that was a very hard day. I cried a lot of tears when the apple trees came out. I think all the neighbors down on William Street did too, um, because it was just, it was overgrown at that point, but it was, it still represented something special, but. So the good news is, is last year we started replanting the orchard. Mm -hmm. So last year we planted about 300 uh, new trees, um, about 10 different varieties. Um, on semi-dwarf rootstock. So those trees um, typically take about three, three to four years to bear fruit. So we should see our first fruit from those trees in 2024 and 25. We'll see a little bit in 24, but, um, and then this year we have um, 300 more trees ordered mm -hmm. from a nursery in New York that um, grafted some select trees that we wanted. And so we'll be planting um, early April or so, okay. whenever they get here, early April probably. Um, so that'll finish out um, the, I guess, new orchard. And we should have around 15 to 20 varieties when it's mm -hmm. all said and done. Yeah, and a total tree count of around 600. Yeah. So I get asked a lot, what did grandpa's orchard look like? The eight, total acreage on the plot that grandpa was act, was actively harvesting was probably th was three times um, the size. So we have a third of what grandpa did. But grandpa planted, most of his orchard were the old standard trees. So they were huge, mm -hmm. um, very, very, very tall, very big. So what that means is that you can't plant trees very close together because they get massive. So we had, looking at old um, aerial footage, we've estimated that grandpa had around 1200 trees in peak production so 1200 trees we will have 600 so even though we only have a third of the land we will still have what we believe is a meaningful 
amount. Um, It'll be a really nice you pick, which is what we wanted. We'll always have to supplement apples um, just th with the amount of apple butter and cider that we make. Um, but we s intentionally selected some varieties of apple trees that are newer and more for um, eating and even making cider. We'll be able to create new cider profiles um, and then allow people to bring their families, pick apples, like mm. varieties that they've never heard of, like Snow Sweet and Gold Rush and yeah, uh, Some are new, Crisp but some, and, are, yeah. some are more of the heirloom varieties yeah. too. And they were done to pay tribute yeah. to Grandma and Grandpa on some of their favorite varieties, some of the old-fashioned varieties that are really hard to find yeah. mm -hmm. anymore. So a and mix then, of old and new. Yeah, I guess just like a final thought on, on the vision of the orchard from like the farming aspect. We, you know, intend to grow the, continue to grow the apples uh, butter business. Um, we have a lot of room to expand with the cider. Um, we'll never pasteurize, <laughs> <laughs> mark my word. Um, and then we actually planted um, some blueberry bushes last year. So we're kind of fascinated with the idea of creating more, more than just an orchard. So mm -hmm. incorporating um, other food that mm -hmm. people can come and pick and learn about. So um, I envision, um, and this would be maybe for like a 10 year plan, but blueberry bushes and maybe some peach trees and some nut trees and- um, Elderberry? Possibly elderberry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, the sky's the limit. Um, I'm hoping one day that chickens can f can free roam out of New York. We'll talk to the mayor about that one. But, um, yeah, and then even um, this year, we're going to be planting um, some produce. We're going to be putting some lettuce in and some, mm -hmm. um, we're going to try our hand at growing cucumbers and some things like that. So, um, yeah, I kind of wanted to create a place where, where kids can come, families can come. And, and not just buy and eat great food, but learn about like the, the process um, mm -hmm. that God has created that, that we grow food. So. And inspire others too. Yeah, inspire I mean, others, backyard I, gardens. <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced that if I can be an apple farmer, if I can be called to this, then anybody. And I think it's good. I think it's good for us to learn the process so that we can do the same in our own backyards on a smaller scale. Or bigger. Maybe you want to plant 600 trees, too. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy like us. Okay, so you brought up the other produce. So I don't know if you realize this, but when the orchard was sold in 1946, mm -hmm. it actually had 1,008 apple trees mm -hmm. on the property and 350 peach trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did know that. I didn't the know the exact numbers, but... Yeah. yeah. So... I had, in that information you had sent me, I had <laughs> saw that. I did not know that until you had brought that to our attention. Um, I knew that my grandfather had tried his hand at peach and pear trees on mm -hmm. the property. And the pe he didn't care for growing the peach trees. <laughs> so there was a, a short time frame to that. One thing that people have told us, and I'm... I'm not so convinced that it's true. I think I need to try my hand at it first before I agree or disagree. But we've been told that the reason that peaches are usually not so successful mm -hmm. in um, northern Indiana is because of our microclimates. So one thing that happens is like the weather we're experiencing right now where when it gets super mild yeah. and the buds start to form and they get too far open and then we'll go through another round of summer we're in fake spring right now and we'll go mm -hmm. i mean winter where we'll have a snow that'll happen somewhere between march or april it'll freeze off and then you won't get a peach crop and so but i do know that kircher's grows quite a bit of peaches um, and they're only in goshen i can't believe Japanese microclimate's that different so i would love to try it again i can't say we'll have that many hundred peach trees <laughs> <laughs> yeah but maybe we'll give it a try. Yeah. So, and you guys have been talking about your apple butter and your apple cider and how you're known for that. So, can you just walk us through the process of how you make these items? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I'll start with it. I'll start with the apple cider because it's fairly straightforward. So we have a um, our commercial press that was put in, um, I think, sometime in the '70s, and it's a it's a continuous press, so it allows us to do a significant amount of uh, volume. 
So we can do about, um, if we're running, I'd say full steam ahead, <laughs> we can do about 200 or so gallons an hour. Um, I find that it runs a little bit better if we don't run full steam ahead. There's um, Being an older machine, um, it has its um, flaws and weak points. So, Ticks. <laughs> yeah. So what we do is we, um, obviously the apples get harvested. Um, and then they get sorted. So when the pickers pick the apples, they're, they're essentially cleaning the tree. So they pick the small apples, the big apples, the pretty apples, the ugly apples. Um, from there they get sorted or graded. And then so that's where you get your nice, um, nice looking apples or um, size apples, <clears throat> excuse me, that typically go to retail. Um, and then the other apples, we call them juice apples or number twos. And so those would be the apples that are um, smaller in size, maybe uh, maybe they were um, uh, they formed irregularly or something, or maybe they had a little bit of insect damage or something. There's nothing wrong with the apple other than the fact that it it's a number two. It's not a number one, so they don't fetch as high quality or as high value. Um, so we use those for making cider or juice. So the process that we use is we wash the apples. Um, we um, run them through a grinder that essentially turns them into like a pulp. It's um, it's not quite applesauce, but it's um, it's a very high high speed motor that basically just pulverizes the apple. And so you want to get the apple into the smallest part like particles that you can to extract the most juice. And then so from there we feed it into a press. Um, we press the juice out of the apple. The pulp goes. Um, get separated and then we use that back in the orchard as fertilizer or animal feed or um, there's some different uses for it. Um, we filter the juice a couple times um, and then we jug it and then it's ready. So our process is very simple. Um, we don't pasteurize it which means that we don't heat it up. So unpasteurized cider um, contains all the probiotics and all the natural um, yeasts that would exist out in the field. And so because we don't pasteurize, um, we have a very short um, shelf life on it. Um, so typically after about two weeks, um, our cider will naturally start to ferment. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't make the cider necessarily harmful or hurtful to drink. Um, but we don't recommend it for uh, little kids and little <laughs> <laughs> people who are uh, not wanting to consume you know, alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. But it is just a process that happens naturally, very much how um, what would happen when you would make uh, grape juice or something. So that would be the cider. Um, we we see our peak season in September and October, and then it sort of trickles down toward the end of the year. Something new I will mention that we added this year that we started doing is we've been continuing pressing cider um, January, February, and March with a smaller press. So our large press, it takes about four hours to clean it when we're done. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I don't like to just run, you know, 50 or 100 bushel of apple through it. I like to, you know, do a lot at a time. Uh, we'll typically make six to 800 gallons at a time on that press. Um, with the smaller press, I can do a two or three bushel at a time. So we've been experimenting with different apple flavors and, and still kind of meeting the small demand that Napanee community has for cider. Um, apple butter is a little more complicated. Um, the recipe that we use, we use about 150 gallons of apple cider and around 800 pounds of apples, which would be about 20 bushel. And so essentially we cook the apples to make them soft. We run them through a giant uh, machine that <clears throat> separates the skins, stems and seeds from the flesh. And then that's uh, where you get your applesauce. And then from there, we combine the cider and the applesauce. We slow cook it for about two to three hours mm -hmm. until it's the consistency that we like. Um, add spices. And then we have a couple different varieties. We have a no sugar option. We have a, a with cinnamon and sugar option. And then, yeah, we jar it. Yeah. And Last year, we also added um, applesauce to the mix. We actually, um, through our distributor, we got a request from an orchard out in California to make applesauce. And so we just took grandma's recipes and introduced a regular, a cinnamon, and a no sugar 
applesauce. It was kind of one of those things where, why haven't we done this before? This sort of makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so <laughs> last year we officially released applesauce to the line too. And yeah. that's been nice because a lot of the orchards we do work for have loved that too. They all have family recipes. And so they bring apples and say, I want you to use only these apples and no sugar or whatever they, whatever their family recipe is. And so we cook it according to their recipe and send it back to them. So I think one thing that I'm really proud that we're able to do is offer a product that um, has only a couple ingredients and no preservatives, no artificial preservatives. So mm -hmm. um, it's fun being able to to talk to people that come into our store who are um, more conscious about what they're putting into their body and be able to offer them, for example, our no sugar applesauce has one ingredient. It is apples. apples. <laughs> That's so, it. Um, yeah. No acids, no preservatives, no... Um, yeah. That part feels yeah. good. So. Um, the cider, too. I think because of what we're used to getting in the grocery stores sometimes, um, when things are made to be on the shelf for a really long time. Some of the preservatives mm -hmm. that get added. Um, I have a lot of conversations, usually with moms, that are, well, wait a minute, there's nothing in this. No, there's nothing in this but the, the apple squeezed. Just mm -hmm. the juice. The more we learn about food, um, I think you're sort of seeing a shift. And um, it's it's really better for our bodies to, to consume it like that. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see 20 years from now if, if we can you know, yeah. go back and see if we're healthier because we're we've made the choice not to consume so much. That's overly, mm -hmm. overly processed. processed. Or, yeah. So, yeah. so um, the orchard is one of the factors to why we have an apple festival. Mm -hmm. It is, um, especially since we're probably one of the only cities who has an apple orchard within its city limits. Mm -hmm. Also, um, so what does the festival mean to you and your family? And how are you involved? Well, the Apple Festival is obviously deeply personal. <laughs> so um, I don't remember because I wasn't born yet, but my dad talks fondly about the year that it all came about and how some of the different city members, volunteers, had approached um, he and Grandma and Grandpa about doing a festival that was in honor of apples and you know, incorporated the orchard and if they would be okay with that. And dad has memories of just what that, what the first couple festivals were actually like. I mean, they were mm -hmm. tiny and they happened, you know, right up here, um, uptown. And it was not nearly the footprint, obviously, that we've grown to. Um, but dad has been on the festival committee um, for 46 years. He's the longest running member. Um, He's packed with all kinds of stories of serving where, when the festival went from tiny festival of just being a day festival to adding days, to adding rides, to operating um, more on a, a larger scale and what those decisions were like for the town and for the committee. And um, I... I have loved the festival because I, the one thing that still floors me is how a tiny little town that is just over 6,000 people, we have averaged somewhere between 80 to 100,000 people for the last eight festivals. Mm -hmm. So a town of just over 6,000 hosts that many people in a three and a half day event. That's incredible. And I think we do it well because I know we do it well because we keep having the same numbers year after year. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if we have people that don't visit us every year, we're sustaining um, that level of visitors. And so I just think that's incredible. And I think it's even though that was maybe that's maybe the premise of why people come that weekend, I am convinced that when you come to Napanee, and you see what it has to offer, you will come back mm -hmm. uh, for a day trip. We are a lovely town between Coppice Commons and our downtown quadrant with Main Street and Neighbors and Key Boutique and Vinnie's and just all those businesses that are right there. And then 
the barns uh, to the side of town. Like, it's just a lovely place. It's lovely. And so, um, so yeah, I, it's deeply personal. I started volunteering in the committee um, when we made that move home from Indianapolis. So uh, 2014 was my first year serving. Now I handle um, all of the corporate sponsorships for the festival so we can keep the festival free and still continue to provide high quality entertainment and events for the festival goers without cost. Um, I have been a part of the core committee now for I don't know how many years, but um, it's a lot of work. I don't think people recognize that mm -hmm. the Apple Festival meets yearly. It never stops. Yeah. <laughs> um, it takes a lot to plan that kind of, of event, but it's really made up of a lot of wonderful volunteers who love Napanee, and that's at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. I think what I enjoy most about it is all the out-of-town people that come through, and um, specifically in the last three years that we've had the opportunity to be um, running the orchard. Um, just getting to know people who come, it's amazing where people come from and just to hear their stories. And mm -hmm. I think we take <clears throat> Napanee for granted, those of us who grew up here and live here. And uh, we truly do live in a very special place. Mm -hmm. So, And I think as we look forward to what's the orchard's role, if we look to the future, what's the orchard's role with the Apple Festival, we sort of knew that if we would have the opportunity to take over the orchard, we really wanted to have the orchard be more intertwined into mm -hmm. the festival than what it had been. And so we hope to in future years, especially as the, the trees are mature and can handle people walking down amongst them, um, doing cider pressing demonstrations on site and letting people come to the orchard, conducting tours, being more of an educational component to the festival so mm -hmm. we can offer um, we've really enjoyed some school groups coming down this year to the orchard and just explaining like how do yeah. we even get food um, you know it doesn't just magically appear on grocery store shelves <laughs> it, there's a process to it and so just teaching kids um, teaching people how this is how the trees grow and this is how you care for them and when the apples are ready to be picked this is what happens to them they either go to the store or they get sorted for production which would be cider or apple butter so yeah nice so uh, I have one last question um, so Napanee has had quite a few crops that have been made for large production um, and have brought attention to this area in the early in the late 1800s we were producing uh, tomatoes a lot mm -hmm. um, in the early 1900s, we had potatoes, onions, and mints, and cabbage, and the apples came about in like the 19, 1930s, 1940s. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that apples have been such a mainstay in Napanee? Mm -hmm. Well, it offers a way better dessert than any of those other things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you- I mean, the apple festival Onion pie or onion, onion, onion dumplings. Too. I mean- yeah. <laughs> You know, I can't say. I know that, yeah, from reading the things that you have put together about the history of Napanee, Martha, like I've learned about some of the other areas of production that we've had and that we even had an onion festival for a period of time. The mm -hmm. best I can land on, uh, I guess, too, when I look at the way other things are celebrated in the state, mm -hmm. we tend to go with sweeter things <laughs> yeah. or things like popcorn. I don't know. Potatoes and onions seem <laughs> a little polarizing. <laughs> Not quite as fun. Apples are sweet, and who doesn't love a good apple? And we certainly couldn't put onions in a bin on the corner to take <laughs> during the festival. That would they be disgusting. Be free, and they probably still would be <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm glad that it has because I think it's, for all the reasons we've talked about, it's a wonderful event for our town that shows off what a special place this is um, but I think the reason that it's successful is because of those people who loved who have loved Napanee over the decades and have been willing to pour themselves into 
just creating a really good festival. And I think the byproduct mm -hmm. is we as the stewards of the apple farm are benefiting, but it's by no work of just us. It's all the people mm -hmm. who have gone before us. Maybe I'll put a challenge out there to anybody listening. <laughs> um, if you have land and you're interested, <laughs> why not plant potatoes or onions or <laughs> mint or whatever? We can um, have another festival. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Two festivals. Yeah. I, I would say the more the more people we have locally growing food for the community, the better everybody is. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So is there anything else that we didn't touch on or talk about that you guys wanted to add that our overall overarching desire for the orchard? I remember I grew up there. Um, my whole childhood is wrapped up in that property. And um, one thing I wasn't prepared for um, when we opened the doors for the first time in what would have been Apple Festival weekend, 2020 that was canceled because of COVID, I was overwhelmed by how many people walked in to the store and either started to cry or um, recalled fond memories. And they didn't all center around my family. It was they had a memory of coming there with someone they loved as a kid mm -hmm. with their grandma or they came with their mom or they came with a family member or they were kids that lived down the street that always rode their bikes and got um, candy and it just evoked all these memories and I wasn't I wasn't prepared for that and what I hope is that we will steward it well and so we will create beauty again down in that corridor of town Mm -hmm. Because it is a little industrial um, because of the factory that's right there, um, the ATC's factory, and um, just the beauti natural beautification that we hope to do down in that area for the neighbors that live around there. But just also being a light for the community, um, being a place that um, people in Napanee feel connected to, feel like they're a part of, um, a place that can be... Yeah, just a light for this community. Yeah, I, th I would hope long after we're gone that uh, Napanee would still be known for apples and, um, you know, that we would be able to add to the credibility that Nikki's grandparents and parents and, and even the generation before them um, added. Mm -hmm. um, we're approaching 100 years, I guess on the orchard. We think it was originally planted sometime in the 30s. Martha knows that number. Yeah. She knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, it it was what's really funny is it was actually um, planted and created as a hobby cuz the gentleman retired from uh -huh. his job. He had been ma so Mr. Uline had been Napanee's mayor and the owner and operator of Napanee Lumber uh -huh. and he needed something to do in his retirement so he planted Plant an apple orchard. orchard. <laughs> I and knew Martha what? would know. <laughs> what year was that? Um, I can't pinpoint the year exactly but it was in the 1930s. Okay yeah, yeah. so. Yeah one of the Uline family members does <clears throat> exist and she has come down to the orchard. She's still living. She's very. Yeah. Very old. I think it was his daughter. Is that right? Yeah, I don't. I don't remember exactly. Um, but yeah, it, it just cultivates. I mean, even even for me, I grew up a couple blocks from the orchard, and I I mean I can remember, you know, playing in it and riding my bike through it, and you know, just um, shopping at Maynard's old store with my mom, and so it it's a it's a lot of like fond memories. It's a good happy memory bank. So. That's kind of, you know, our ultimate hope that people would have a good experience when they come down, uh, that they would feel welcome, that they would, um, yeah, just enjoy not just what they buy and eat there, but, you know, being around and learning about the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you to the both of you for sitting thank down you. with me and talking about the orchard. I have learned a lot about what you guys do now, so... Thank you so much, and I really appreciate your time. And you're you, welcome, you guys. Yeah. Thank and you for all you do, Martha. <laughs> you dig up the most interesting facts about our town, <laughs> and I think that it is so worthwhile because it makes me love Napanee even more. Oh, good. Um, okay. Because it's such a gem of a place, and so I think it's so important that we have somebody at the helm <laughs> keeping track of the history that's been that's gone before us for sure. 
Thank you. Well, thank you again. Well, that's all that we have for you. A special thank you to Jake and Nikki for being my guest. Next month, we'll be having a part two to our Emma Schrock original episode. I'll have Emma's niece, Alita, back on the podcast, along with Dr. Simon Bronner from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. But before you go, be sure to subscribe to this podcast, hit like, or leave us a comment.